Australia is a country of immigrants, except the First Nations people, of course, although they must have had to come here at some point or other. But anyway, let's <laughs> not go into that. Um, my father uh, was a Dutchman. <clears throat> my husband's father was Ukrainian via Canada. Uh, so I uh, come down the line from immigrants. <clears throat> On my mother's side, they're all Poms, uh, English. Um, on my husband's mother's side, they're all Poms, Scottish, English, all that sort of stuff. All, we're all a bunch. Who, who, can, who knows where they come from? Uh, English? Who, who, what English have we got here? What about European of some description? Yep. Uh, and elsewhere, there are African, Asian, Indian, all over the place. South, the Pacific Islanders, we're, we're from everywhere, aren't we? <clears throat> Why do people leave their country of origin, the place they belong, uh, their birthplace, um, the place where they feel comfortable, possibly, uh, why do they leave those places and come to a new country? Why, why did my father's family do that? We've got a picture. Kirsten's going to put a... Is she there? Nope, she's not. Oh, there she is. Here she comes. She's going to put this... <coughs> run, run, Kirsten, run. She's going to put this picture up for me. This is my father's family when it comes... <coughs> What a good-looking bunch they are. How about that? My father is the one uh, at the back on the right over there, the one with the big grin on his face. That's probably the only grin I ever saw out of him, <laughs> let me just say. He was... Uh, he obviously was a happy boy when he was young, but when he got older, not so happy. So that's my Auntie Corrie, uh, my Uncle John, my Auntie Lainey, and my Omar and Opa. And I don't really know a great deal about this photo. I believe that it was taken not long before they moved to Australia, um, or quite possibly it's a photo taken of them when they were in Australia and they were all naturalised. Uh, so this is the mid-50s that this photo was taken of my father and his family. My father was the eldest, Corrie... Corrie was the eldest, my father was the eldest boy and they were Catholic and that was a very deeply held thing for them, although my father ditched all that. <clears throat> anyway, that's all beside the point. Why, why did they come from Holland or the Netherlands, as they now call it, to Australia? Uh, again, I don't have a lot of information about that. It was like getting blood out of a stone to get my father to talk about anything. He grew up in Nazi-occupied uh, Netherlands and that damaged him a great deal and now as an adult uh, an older adult I can now feel a great deal of compassion for my father because uh, I now have a better understanding I think of what that family went through he was born in 1933 so he was six or seven when the when war broke out and when the Nazis came and occupied the Netherlands and he saw terrible, terrible things. But then when the war was over, they, they, ha they had what they call in the Netherlands the hunger winter of 45, 46. And people were ripping up wooden bits off railway tracks to take home and burn to keep, their, how, keep, to keep them warm. Like there was just, there was nothing to keep them warm. There was no food. Now, the other thing I, I, I vaguely understand about my father's family is that my opa was deeply ashamed by some of the things that he had to do during the war. So he was pressed into service by the Nazis to do things to stop the Allies being able to use the Netherlands uh, as part of the war effort. And, uh, and he, like, he basically had to do things to help the Nazis do what they were doing. And he was deeply ashamed by that. My father had to do things to help feed the family in the absence of his father 
Uh, and, and he felt deeply ashamed by those things, like stealing f- food from other people so they could eat. He felt deeply sh- So when the opportunity came up for them to leave all that behind, you know, <clears throat> they had trouble finding employment, they had trouble finding food after the, after the war. They, it, life was difficult. And so when the opportunity came up and it was said to them, come to Australia... The sun is always shining in Australia. There's food, there's housing, there's employment. Come to Australia. They packed their bags, left everything behind, uh, they and other family members, and they jumped on a boat and they came. And they were like, now we're in Australia and we love it. And that was my father's view. I'm an Australian and I'm going to live as an Australian. And here I am, this is my new life. Okay. And so they came because they were looking forward to something better. They were looking for, they, it was hope. They had hope for something better for themselves. Okay. When we look at the book of Ruth and we look at, at her and what she and Naomi were doing in the book of Ruth, they had no hope. In, um, <laughs> actually, I think we need to be calling Phil Naomi. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm getting sidetracked there. In, uh, in the beginning verses of the book of Ruth, and we're looking at the book of Ruth today, and we're actually going to have a real sort of skip over the book of Ruth real quick. Um, When we look at those early verses in uh, in Ruth chapter uh, one, um, Elimelech and Naomi, they're the parents. They move from Israel to a place called Moab, and uh, because there's famine in Israel, and they move from there to there, uh, and they have some sons in Moab. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, why would you move to? If you're an Israelite, why would you move to Moab? Like Moab, anyway, you know. (laughs) Uh, And then when they get to Moab, Elimelech doesn't actually get what he wants when he gets to Moab. He dies. And then his sons die. And Naomi is left there with her daughters-in-law and they have nothing. They have nothing in Moab. So whatever they moved there for, they now don't have So whatever little bit of hope they might have had, they now don't have. The interesting thing I think about this is Elimelech actually turned his back quite comprehensively on the the God of his um, nationality. When you look at the names that he gave his sons, Marlon and Kilian, they're not Israelite names. They're Canaanite names. They're Moabite names. So he is really comprehensively, he's moved away from Israel. He said, there's nothing there for me, no God, no faith, no whatever. He, he's given up his land. Everybody in Israel had land. They had possessions because that was part of the community to have that stuff. He's given all that up. He's turned his back on it pretty comprehensively. He's gone to Moab. Wow, Moab. Moab. Moab, the people in Moab were descendants of Sodom. Can you imagine what Moab was like? When, when you are without God, you don't get better as a society. You just get worse. Like if you don't have God, you know, pulling you back to his ways, you're, you move away from his ways into the ways of men and the ways of wickedness and evil. If you don't have God, you don't have goodness because God is a God of goodness. So I can't even imagine what Moab was like. I know that they had a God called Chemosh and uh, just recently in uh, the Bible readings, if you're doing the one-year Bible reading um, that Jason suggested at the beginning of the year, um, the kings of Israel that we're now reading about in 1 and 2 Kings, uh, they went after the... Um, what, what did they call them? The detestable practices of Chemosh and Molech. Now, I know that if you followed the god Molech, you sacrificed your children to that god. 
Well, in 1 and 2 Kings, they talk about the detestable practices of Chemosh and Molech. So I can't imagine that Chemosh was any better than Molech or the, the, the following of those gods were any better. And so this is what was Moab was like. So they gave, the, they gave up on what was going on in Israel. I mean, it was a famine, so it probably wasn't a happy time over there. And they went to Moab, the descendants of Sodom and the detestable practices of, their, of whatever they did over there. So let's now just have a quick look at the... Th- there's a couple of passages I want to have a look at in a little bit of depth. And we're going to have a look at chapter 1, starting at verse 11. And Kirsten's going to put that up for me. And I'm going to read it. Uh, Naomi... Um, so Elimelech and uh, the sons have died. Naomi and... Um, And her daughters-in-law are there and Naomi decides she's going back to Israel. There's nothing for her. We've already discovered Moab's a yucky place. She doesn't want to stay there anymore. And the two daughters want to go, daughters-in-law want to go with her. And she says this to them. Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? I mean, this is part of the culture, like, um, you know, the way they did things in those days. You know, if one husband died, then you married his brother and he took the husband's place. Oh, you know, it's all sort of complicated. It doesn't sound much fun to us, does it? (laughs) Uh, And my husband did not have a brother, so I would be stuck. would you wait until they grew up would you remain unmarried for them no my daughters it is more bitter for me than for you because the lord's hand has turned against me she's as dry as an old chip she is and naomi which means pleasant (laughs) there she is pleasant over there Uh, naomi wants to rename herself mara which means bitter now uh okay so It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. She buzzed off. Uh, But Ruth clung to Naomi. And uh, and Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. There's more there for her than there will be for you. More hope there than there will be there. If you come with me. But, and these are the famous verses everyone loves about Ruth. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. And this, we need to always keep these two verses together, 16 and 17. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. This is hopeless. Ruth is not looking forward to a great life in the new country. Like my, pa- my grandparents and, pa- and father, they're like, yay, let's get out of this dump of a place where there's no food, no employment, no, you know, it's cold as the grave, blah, blah, blah. And let's go to Australia where the sun's always shining, there's food and there's jobs and there's stuff and, you know, mangoes on the trees and all that sort of stuff. Let's go there. This is not Ruth. She's like, I'm coming with you but my expectation is this is going to be bad and I might even die. That's her expectation. So, why is she busting to go? Why why is she busting to go with Naomi on this adventure back home? And even Naomi thinks it's not going to be much fun because she knows when she goes back there's nothing there for her. There's no land left. The husband gave that up. Where is she going to live? What la- what where will she get her food from? Like what is this and Ruth knows this, you know. She, this is one of the reasons why she, she knows she needs to go with Naomi. Na- Naomi needs her. There's two reasons, I think, Ruth is busting to go uh, with Naomi back to 
Israel. Um, that's one of them. She knows, that, like Naomi's an old lady. She has got no one who's going to protect her, care for her, help her get her food, help her find somewhere to live, whatever, walk along the, the path or the road back to wherever. Like what is she... Who's going to make sure that some robbers and, you know, terrible people aren't going to come and descend on her and do horrible things to her? Well, I mean, Ruth, what kind of protection was she really? But anyway, two's better than one. A young woman with an older woman, that's better than one old lady on her own. (laughs) So that's one of the reasons. The other reason, and I think this is the big reason, is Ruth had faith. We, we pick that up and I'm going to explain in a sec how, how we pick that up. Ruth, where did, she, where did she come by that faith that she had? She must have come by that faith from the testimony of Naomi's life. The way Naomi... So Naomi is quite different to Elimelech. Elimelech had turned his back on God. He dragged his family to another country and he'd taken on the stuff of that country even down to, you know, the way we name our children is very telling, isn't it? Like, we, I did not call my son Muhammad. Though the, cho- the school that my children went to, there were kids there called that. But the, the culture that they came from, that was the kind of name they named their children. We named our children Australian names because we're Australian. Elimelech... He'd taken on the culture of his new country. He named his kids the, the kind of names that you found in that country. He turned his back completely. Naomi, however, it appears, had not. She was a woman of faith and Ruth is now a woman of faith, the testimony of Naomi's life. And you can see this. You can't see this in the passage uh, but in my translation, you can, you can see this. So when in um, verse 17, when Ruth says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried, may the Lord. So in the passage, in, in my Bible, Lord, L-O-R-D, is capitalised. Now in your Bible, when L-O-R-D, they're all capitals, that actually is a translation for the personal name of God, Yahweh, the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. He said, I am who I am. That is the personal name of God. Ruth is using the personal name of God when she talks to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely. The Lord, may my God, Yahweh, may he be really tough on me if I let you go to this place and this future and this hopelessness without me. Ruth knew if she did not stick it out with Naomi, her faith would die. She knew if she stayed in Moab, she would fall back. And that's what what happens, doesn't it? The people we hang out with is the kind of stuff we take on. Ruth knew that and she said, I need to stick with you. You're my friend and you're my mentor in faith and I need to stick with you. I'm coming and I don't care what's going on over there. I'm coming with you because you need me and I need you. And she went and that's why she was busting to go. Okay. So, they, let me just, okay. So, they go back to Israel, to Bethlehem, uh, in a significant place, but we don't know that yet. Um, And they go back to Bethlehem and it tells us in the passage um, that they arrived as the barley harvest was beginning. That is an important point for us. And it was good for those women. Uh, That was a good time to arrive in Bethlehem. And so let me now look at um, chapter 2, starting at verse 6. That's our next passage. 
Uh, and so what's happened is they've arrived in Bethlehem, they've settled in, I mean, it doesn't tell us where they, what house they live in or where they find this house or whatever. They settle into a place in Bethlehem and they're like, okay, what are we going to do now? We've got to have some food. So they have a little bit of strategizing together and Ruth decides she's going to go into the fields and glean, uh, which she does. And she finds herself in this particular field where Boaz is the owner of the field. But there is a, like a foreman type of a guy who's running the show in that field. And Boaz turns up and he says to the overseer, who's she? And the overseer, starting at verse 6, replies this. She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow. So there's a little bit of strategizing. Ruth finds herself in this field and there is Boaz. In that culture, women needed men. It wasn't like today, uh, well... I mean, it's, some people say, some pe- some people say it's a man's world still, but as a woman, you can actually survive without a man, you, and you can be quite happy without uh, a man in your life. Strange as that might seem to some, uh, but the women needed men. They needed them for provision. They needed them for protection. They needed them to to help have a family. Well, every woman now needs that, although. Anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> they needed them for wealth. They ne- they basically needed them for everything. Like you could you could as a woman you couldn't really survive. And if you were a single woman, you lived in your father's house and he continued to provide for you, or your brothers or whoever the men in your family were. And if you had no men, as a woman you were in trouble. And so Naomi. And Ruth, two single women, an older woman who's really not capable of gleaning, she doesn't put her hand up and say, I'll come and help out. She's probably too old and arthritic and, you know, all sorts of health problems and what have you. She needs Naomi to go and do that and help provide for her. And if you were a a single woman on your own, it was hard. You lived in poverty and to rise up a little way and to get a little bit of something that you needed, it was going to be hard, hard work and dangerous. And we see that in the passage. God's law provided for, uh, for women. So in Leviticus 23, we see that this, this, um, this law about gleaning, if you owned a field, you were not allowed to glean up. You weren't allowed to harvest right up to the edges. You had to leave a little bit for poor people to come and get something. Like God's law said, don't take everything for you. Don't maximise your profits is what God's law said. Don't grab everything for yourself and not care about those in poverty and in need. And they made a law. However, all these laws were fabulous if people kept them. But Boaz, what a guy. Like what is wrong with the women in Bethlehem that they hadn't snapped this guy up already? Like how could he have been... And he seems to be an older fellow. Why was he not married already? Why? What bunch of stupid women in Bethlehem who hadn't seen... What a fabulous guy this was and married him. Because he was a guy who kept this law. 
He didn't harvest right up to his edges. And when Ruth showed up, he did some actually unprecedented things with for her. He, uh, he says to Ruth, stay with the women who work for me. So he doesn't leave her on the edges picking up the leftovers. He actually brings her down into the field and she's not gleaning anymore. She's harvesting. And she's got this apron or shawl or whatever it is. She's, you know, this great big skirt or whatever. And she's filling it up with all the goodies that she can carry home. But not only does he do that, he tells the men in the field, don't touch this woman, don't molest her, don't give her a hard time, don't sexually harass her, don't do anything to her, leave her alone. So it it obviously was a dangerous occupation to be gleaning in a field, like you could be, you could have anything done to you. To be a poor woman, you have to go out and glean it was a dangerous business. But Boaz comes along and he says to his men, leave her alone. He says to her, go and you know, get in amongst it with the other women who are working. Take whatever you can find. And then at the end he says, uh, leave some extra for her. But not only that, there's more. He shares his lunch with her. Come and sit down and have a little bit of this. Well, everybody around can see what's going on, can't they? They're all like, mm. and, and that's what. And people love this book for that, don't they? They love it because they're like, oh, the romance. It's like watching a movie. <clears throat> but Boaz, what a guy Boaz was! What a guy he like, and he's not just because he's done all these great things for her. It's because he's heard about. He like he's actually listened to the nice things that people have said about her and he's like, look, she's actually a nice woman. Like, she's a good sort. She's come all this way with her mother-in-law to help her out, to provide for her and care for her, to make sure things are okay for her. She's actually made a big sacrifice. So... So, Boaz, he cares... He protects, he provides all these things for Ruth and therefore for Naomi. And in verse um, 20 of chapter 2, it turns out that Boaz actually has a reputation for this. He's a kind man. Naomi knows this about Boaz. She says he's kind to the living and the dead. Well, they're the living, Ruth and Naomi. Um, Elimelech's the dead, Boaz is kind to Elimelech by looking after, even though Elimelech has turned his back on all those things, Boaz still looks after his women folk. And they're probably not the first or the only ones that Boaz has been this kind to. And you see, when he gets to the, the um, city gate and he, he has this dealing with the other kinsman redeemer, you see in those interactions, that he's a nice guy. He's a decent guy. He's actually a man of faith. He's a man of God, this guy Boaz. And it turns out he's a kinsman redeemer. Now, this is a complicated uh, part of the law and I now notice I've gone for about half an hour and I've still got a little bit to go. So I won't go into the complications of that law about kinsman redeeming stuff, um, except to say that it's, it, it becomes his responsibility to um, care for these women. And so uh, our next little passage from chapter 4, I think it's chapter 4, um, verses 5 and 6, um, Boaz says to the other kinsman redeemer who's ahead of him, he says, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. This is part of that law of God that he's provided. At this the guardian redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. This guy, this first kinsman redeemer, he knows that if he buys up uh, the land and whatever of Elimelech, if he redeems all that, he's going to lose it. Because 
when Boaz buys it, it doesn't belong to him. He buys it for Naomi. So he spends his own money and then he has to give it back to Naomi. So this other guy, he realises, I mean, not only probably does he not want another mother-in-law and wife in his, in his household, but if he spends his money on this stuff, it then doesn't belong to him. It belongs to them. But Boaz, I mean, he's probably a rich guy, but Boaz is prepared to make that sacrifice. And we see that later in chapter 4. Uh, And so from verse 9, Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian and Marlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, uh, Marlon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. um, Boaz spends his own money... And none of this belongs to him. It belongs to the dead man and his family and his name. So there's a little bit of wheeling dealing there with with Boaz and the other one. But in the end, Boaz is the one that makes the sacrifice. And he's the one who takes on Ruth and Naomi and he actually gives them back their stuff. Uh, So then, uh, verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, again capitalised, praise be to Yahweh, hallelujah, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Not only has Boaz given up the land and the family... Because it all goes to Naomi. He has given up his firstborn son. She, Naomi, gets the son. She takes him in her arms and he's her son. He's the replacement for the sons and the husband that she's lost. So Boaz is kind of the big loser in this whole deal. But he doesn't care. He's happy. He's got Ruth. He's going to have other children. He doesn't care. He's like, "Um," you know, he's a kind man. He's happy to make these sacrifices. Okay. <clears throat> but there's more. There's, in, this, in these verses, this whole redeemer thing doesn't stop with Boaz. If you look back at this, that verse, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. They're talking about the redeemer. Ruth has given birth to the redeemer. So there's, there's actually three redeemers in this passage. Boaz, who's, he's, like, he's the formal one. He's the one that, you know, the, the one by law. Ruth is also a redeemer. She redeems Naomi. She helps Naomi buy back her, her life. But then the third redeemer, the great redeemer, is there in that verse the one that Ruth has given birth to. That's the redeemer of the future. That's the line of King David that will reign for eternity. There it is right there. So this whole idea of redeem, the redeemer, the one who's going to buy us back, it's, it's there and the promise is right there. Okay, Okay, I'm going to finish now, <clears throat> but we, we're actually talking about lessons in discipleship. That's, <laughs> that's the, the, the kind of season we're in at the moment. Lessons in, what are we going to learn about discipleship? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? That we, so let me say, where are we? Expectations and redemption. Ruth's expectations... 
no, there was no hope. She, they were hopeless. She was leaving this crappy place, Moab, for what her expectation was possibly an even crappier place, if you excuse my language, I probably shouldn't use that word, but you know what I mean. She's leaving one bad place for maybe possibly even a worse one. She's expecting sacrifice, hardship, possibly even death. Her, her faith in God did not teach her to expe- expect something better. It taught her that she'd have to give stuff up for the sake of others. Discipleship. Is discipleship, what is it? Is it about getting what we want? So I'll have faith in you, God, if you give me the life I want. I don't know about you, but that's me quite often. I, I, I only, I'll only really follow you, God. I'll only really stick with you if you give me what I want. Now, that all came a bit of a cropper when my husband died. I could not make any sense of that, but I couldn't give up on God. So sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm a control freak who says... This is the way I want you to work out my life. So what are my expectations? That God will fix my life for me. That he will give me the things that I want. And God does say that he will provide for us. But I think we take that a step too far when we say, well, you have to provide for me what I want you to provide for me. Whereas God says, I will provide for you what you need. And that's what he thinks we need, not what we think we need. So the first lesson, I think, in, in discipleship, and I think that this fits with what Jason was saying when he was talking, to, talking about being yoked to Jesus. When we yoke, what was Jesus? He was our redeemer. He's the one who sacrificed for us. He died for us. When we're yoked to Jesus, we don't have an expectation of getting all the goodies that we want in life. We have to have an expectation of, of, ta- of having what God wants us to have. We don't get to tell him or control him. We get to get, get, have what he hands out. And if that's hardship, if that's suffering, if that's the things that come our way, then that's what it is. And we say, I will trust in you regardless of what my circumstances are because I put my faith in you. (coughs) And for Ruth, it was all about radical obedience with no conditions. And that's what it is, discipleship, that's what it is for us. Radical obedience, no conditions. She went, she cared, she sacrificed, she expected hardship. Her goals in life were whatever God handed out to her I mean, fortunately for her, it all kind of worked out. I mean, she ended up with a lovely husband and a family and plenty of food to eat and, you know, a mother-in-law and, you know, a really nice community. Worked out for her. Wonderful. But she had no expectation of that. Redemption. What redemption? We have been redeemed. If If you believe in Jesus, you have been redeemed. You have been bought back from whatever your life was before to what God wants it to be now. You've been bought back. You have to live your life like you've been redeemed. You can't live your life like you haven't. You can't keep going back to that stuff, back to the drink, back to the drugs, back to the selfishness, back to the whatever, whatever it was. I I had a moment in my life, it was a long time ago, and I had this moment of clarity that said, what what would I be without God? What would I be like as a person? And it was not a pretty picture. (laughs) Not a pretty picture. Because that family I grew up in, as beautiful as they look in that picture, they were not a beautiful set of people. My father... Anyway, I won't go into that because we're running out of time. I've run out of time already. Um, what, 
I've been redeemed out of that. I have to honour God with my life now and live like a redeemed person. That's discipleship. Live like a redeemed person. Second, kindness and friendship. I'm going to be real quick with this. Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, the whole lot of them, the women who say that to Naomi, you know, your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons. Well, seven sons, that's the perfect family. So that one daughter-in-law, are you going to have more sons? Is that why you're laughing? (laughs) That daughter-in-law was better to Naomi, these women say, than the perfect family. So they all get it. They see the kindness and the love and the care and the provision and that beautiful relationship that's there with Ruth and Naomi and now Boaz who, who buys into that. And I mean, he's already that. And they go, this, this is what we need. We need kindness and friendship. You've got it. We'd love it. Actually, that's what Christianity, being a Christian, is all about. It's being kind and being a friend. And Jason talked about this when he said, un, um, understand Christian community. When we understand Christian community, it's about loving and caring and providing for and supporting and being there. And do you know what? This church is fabulous at that. You know what, I, I just, I think this is, this church, and I see, you know, Raylene, she's got some problems, Gordon's taking her to hospital, people are, you know, doing whatever. Rob is being visited by people, people are going and playing songs <laughs> in his room. You know, he's being, and Emily, they're being looked after. I mean, em- Emily's parents are doing a great job, excellent. Everyone's doing a great job. Um... Janet, what a terrible position. I feel for Janet. I know where she, I absolutely know where she is at right now. She needs our love and our care and our provision and our help. This is, this is what God wants our church, wants the church, not, not just our church, but the church. That's what he wants it to be. You know, I've been in churches and this is going to sound judgmental and it probably is, but these nasty, gossipy, prickly, demanding, you know, and you think, oh, geez, do I want to go to church this morning? There's going to be that person who's like that and that person who's like that and that person who's like that and I don't really want to go there to hang out with those people. I never feel that about this church. I think, wow, what a community this church is. Praise God. It is... and I, I take it that the temperature of the leaders of the church is what sets the temperature of the church. And I think Jason and Tara are fabulous pastors and do a fabulous job. This, would you want to come to this church if you walked in the door and no one said hello to you and they were, everyone was standing in their little groups of friends and um, you walked in, you sat down, nobody cared, nobody noticed, nobody said a word to you. No, you wouldn't. You would go, I don't want to go to that church. I'll go and find a church that's friendly. Yes, that's what you would do. You would not want to come here if people weren't friendly to you, if people didn't speak to you. This is what God wants his church to be, and we as his disciples need to be that, kind and friendly. And that's what we see in this book of Ruth, kind and friendly. There are no expectations for, you know, our life to be as we want it in a nice cute little box that's all beautiful um, and redeemed, honouring God with our lives because we've been taken out of that and brought into this. Let me pray. I know that I've spoken for a long time. Let me pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father... We thank you so much for the testimony of Ruth, of Naomi, of Boaz and of Jesus. We thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their kindness. We thank you for, <coughs> for the redemption that they have won. That they won for each other and the redemption that Jesus has won for us. <coughs> thank you. 
Heavenly Father, for this book and for the lessons it teaches us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.